Get ready to witness a face-off that will leave you questioning everything you know about VO2 max testing. In this video, we will be comparing VO2 max readings from lab-based testing and a Garmin watch in a battle for accuracy and reliability. Join us as we dive into the data and explore the importance of knowing your limits. A direct measurement is always gonna be A, more accurate and B, more reliable because we're actually physically taking a measurement. Whereas a watch is going to work off a predictive model that was ultimately derived from using hundreds of subjects that were directly measured. So in a direct measured test, we're looking at oxygen consumed or the amount of oxygen that is taken in and then the amount of carbon dioxide that is breathed out. In that pure measurement, we can then use a ratio between oxygen in and carbon dioxide out to give us a ratio known as a um, RER, respiratory quotient, and we know that different intensities elicit a different ratio so that you can then use that to help determine training zones. When you're using a watch, it's a predicted VO2 max, and we are then inferring what those transition thresholds are based on estimated percentages that we generally see with most people, but we know that those numbers shift with training status and in some cases with genetic ability or predisposition. So you're always going to get better information and more accurate information if you physically measure what you are trying to find out. So as Lindsay has mentioned, um, the watches aren't doing a direct measurement of VO2 max. What they're doing is they're estimating VO2 max using submaximal oxygen uptake. What do I mean by this? So when you go out for a run, you're not going out and hammering that run like you would in a test where you do a ram test until you reach your peak. So what the watch does is that you need to go out for a run that's a minimum length for you to actually get enough data. Garmin says that 10 minutes is sufficient for the watch to generate enough data. And what it does is it's comparing speed and heart rate and using that to compute um, a theoretical VO2 max. And what it does is that for that 10 minutes, it breaks the run up into short segments or 20 to 30 seconds at a minimum. And it records the speed at those of those segments and uses those to estimate oxygen uptake. The reason for this is that research has shown that in absolute terms, um, oxygen uptake doesn't change with body weight, but in relative terms it does. So what the watch can do is estimate your absolute, um, your, your absolute oxygen uptake as sub-maximal speeds for those sections, and then use your weight to then work out your relative um, oxygen uptake as sub-maximal speeds. And then the next thing though is that the speed doesn't matter on its own. You need to know what effort you're running at. And the watch then uses heart rate data to then estimate your effort. So what it needs to do here is to know what your heart rate maximum is. And this is where things get a little bit dicey because we know that um, heart rate maximum is a very, very difficult thing to calculate. So if you're using age-based um, measures of heart rate, the heart rate maximum might be inaccurate. But in any case, what the watch will do is we'll take the heart rate maximum and the heart rate you're running at in those segments and compute essentially a relative effort. So let's say, for example, the watch works out that using the speed you're running at, that your VO2 is 40 um, mils per kilogram per minute. What it will then do is say, based on your heart rate, you're running at 80%, at 80%, it will mean that your VO2 max is 50, and this is an estimation. So we need to appreciate that there are limitations to this method. Um, in a lab environment, it's a very, very controlled environment. It's temperature controlled. You're running on a treadmill, so you know that the speed is accurate. And with a watch, you're dealing with the environment. So the first thing is that um, the, the watch has no idea of knowing what the conditions that you're running in are. So is it hot? Is it windy? Is it hilly? That sort of thing. And the next thing is that you need to make sure that the data coming from the watch is accurate. So the first thing is the speed data. We know that GPS is notoriously very challenged um, in certain conditions. So obviously when you're running in the city or in the forest, um, it might struggle a little bit, a bit with holding GPS. And also when you run uphill or downhill, it does affect the speed calculation a little bit. And the next important thing is the heart rate. So you need to know that the heart rate data coming is accurate. So this is where you start asking questions about whether you're using a strap or you're using the wrist-based sensor. The strap is slightly more accurate, but the wrist-based sensors are catching up with the new watches now that we have. And then you need to ensure that your heart rate maximum is actually accurate. Garmin use a method called First Beat uh, Fitness by a company called First Beat Analytics, which they actually own. And in their white paper, they actually talk about the validation process of this algorithm. And they say that if the heart rate 
date, if the hardware maximum is not accurate, you can be as much as 10% out on the final view of TMS calculation. So that hardware maximum is a very, very important value that you need to have recorded on your watch. And last thing is your weight because VOT Max is ultimately benchmarked against your weight. So in terms of the, in terms of the accuracy of the data, the watch does have a system to remove bad data. And as I said, it works in 20 to 30 second segments. The reason for this is that you can then see if the data in those segments are good. So if the GPS loses signal, for example, or if the heart rate sensor drops off, the watch can pick up that that is bad data and remove those segments out. So there is a little bit of a fail safe in place, but overall, we still need to be aware that these watches do have um, some limitations in terms of accuracy. And also you are not detecting VOT max directly, but rather doing sub-maximal um, predictions. So why is there such a buzz around knowing your VO2 max and why is it important? So VO2 and VO2 max in particular is a really good tool for us to predict performance. So VO2 or VO2 max is your body's ability to utilize oxygen. So VO2 really is a good tool because we get an indication of your body's ability to utilize oxygen. Now, that obviously leads to performance. So if you have a really good VO2, it is usually a good predictor of performance. However, it is important to note here that we also do need to take other factors into account. So more importantly, you might have a really high VO2 max. However, things like running economy and running efficiency are actually more important to performance than just the number of VO2 max. So just to say that you have a good VO2 max doesn't necessarily say that you will perform very well in your next race or your next event, but your body does have an ability to do so. Okay, so as Devin just mentioned, VO2 max does tell us something about performance, but you know, is it the only thing that matters in running? We know that this is not the case. It's not the only value that matters that determines how well you're going to run. In fact, just a little bit of an anecdote. When they were doing the breaking two, the initial breaking two marathon test with Eric Kipchoge at Monza, what they actually found was that their VO2 max values actually went as high as you expected. Those guys, you'd expect them to have values that are superhuman levels, but their values were pretty high, but not exceptionally high. So it meant that there was something else at play with those athletes that were, that were making them as good as they are. So what is that missing piece of the puzzle? The most likely candidate is running economy. So if, if your T max tells you something about how much oxygen you're taking in, running economy tells you about how well you use that oxygen. So this is a measure of how efficiently you use oxygen or how efficiently you burn energy. And what you want is you want a lower number for this because you want to be using less oxygen at any given speed for you to run faster. If you're using more oxygen, um, at a given speed, it means that you're running inefficiently. So the important thing here is that both VO2 max and running economy are trainable. So you don't want to spend all of your efforts um, working at VO2 max efforts to try and improve that. Running economy can be, running economy is a measure of a whole bunch of things, including muscular efficiency um, and that sort of thing and strength. So you want to be doing things that are going to enhance that. So it means running um, at race pace, um, doing maximal efforts and doing strength training. So you can explore a whole variety of ways to improve running economy and in conjunction with VO2 max, it will make you a better runner. So from doing a direct measure test or any sort of lab-based test, you are going to get that peak VO2 or VO2 max number, such as what you would on your watch. But why is it important to know that number? What are you gonna do with that number? So it is valuable, for us to work our training zones and as Lindsay mentioned various thresholds and we can work percentages of VO2 max for training zones and training purposes but again knowing that one number as its own in isolation really doesn't help us too much and there are a lot of other contributing factors that actually assist when it comes to writing your training programs the submaximal data that helps us with heart rate calculations pace calculations as well. So one number in isolation is, I won't say invaluable, but we need to be cautious around using it. You could do a test, whether it's a lab-based test or just get a reading off your watch, and we do the exact same test in a lab twice on the same person, you're still gonna get different results. So it also becomes quite important that we know the calibration, that we know that there is always variability in these tests. And that's why that one number in isolation is not the be all and end all. So as I mentioned earlier, VO2 max is definitely trainable. And part of why we do these tests is that we can figure out what intensity we need to run at 
based either on speed or heart rate for you to be able to improve and work at those, at those levels. Um, but the important thing here is that your actual ceiling for VO2 max is determined by your genetics. All of us are individuals and different people will have a, diff a, high, a higher or lower ceiling. And also know that as you get older, VO2 max will decline. VO2 max tends to peak somewhere in your, tw in your early 20s to late 20s. And once you cross 30, there's an undeniable decline in VO2 max. It doesn't mean that you can't keep performing at a high level, but that that value that you see as a peak will begin to decline. But I actually want to take a step back there because having said that there is a VO2 max, most of us are never ever going to reach our genetic potential. And why is this? It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a huge volume of training for you to reach that particular level. And in a way, we're better off talking about your VO2 peak than your VO2 max necessarily. So it's almost like where you are now, this is your highest attainable VO2 at this point, but it is not your genetic ceiling. That comes over time, and most the elite athletes end up getting to that point. And as I said about um, the athletes that were used to try and break the two-hour marathon, those numbers won't be necessarily as high as you think they will be. As a beginner, your potential to improve your VO2 max or this VO2 peak is much greater. In fact, just any amount of training you do will result in an improvement in the highest VO2 you can reach in a test. So when you start off training, you will improve quite a lot, but as you get better and more experienced and your body adapts to the training process, those margins get finer. Eventually, you'll get to a point like elite athletes where they tend to plateau off. There are little variations as they take time off in the ceiling, but with very little training, they get back to that particular level and those athletes tend to be operating on that particular point. But those athletes still improve, records still get broken. So once you, if you ever, ever reach your VO2 ceiling, it doesn't mean that your performance will peak. There are other factors we can work on. We spoke about running the economy, and other things like lactate threshold also play a very, very big role in performance. Um, and that will help you to keep improving as time goes. Knowing oxygen consumption is a very useful tool so that you can calculate specific intensities to do easy runs plus a variety of high intensity workouts because if we know the physiology that we are trying to train we can dial down fairly specifically i use the word fairly because what you have to understand about physiology is that it works on a continuum it doesn't have a line where we suddenly move from one threshold to another or if we're moving into um, aerobic threshold and then into an anaerobic threshold. These happen across a small range and will change slightly literally depending on the time of day that you do the test or the day of the week that you do the test. But it's still very handy knowing whereabouts those transitional thresholds are taking place because it allows us within a gray area to determine at what speed and heart rate we want to run our easy runs and then as we start progressing through the different intensities, depending on if we're training for a 5K and want to do more uh, peak VO2 type of work, or if we're training for marathons where we want to do a little bit more sub-threshold type of work, it allows us to pinpoint those zones and to really dial in on those intensities. Now that you know what the data means and why it's useful to your running performance, let's answer the big question. What was the difference between my watch VO2 results and the actual VO2 lab assessment? My watch told me that my VO2 max was 53, and the assessment gave me a value of 52. Usually readings from watches are not this accurate because they all use different algorithms that are based on the speed that you're running at versus your heart rate. If you really want to know what your VO2 max is, then the best way to get tested would be in a lab where they will physically analyze the oxygen that you're breathing in and the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out. The lab test will allow you to see a really nice graph that shows you how oxygen demand goes up. And as you get too tight to sustain any more speed increases, there will be a slight little dip at the top of the graph that's very close to your VO2 max. Now you know how to measure VO2 and how to use the information to train more effectively. Now it's time to learn from the best and make sure that you avoid the mistakes that are going to hold you back from progressing. Watch this video and see how the pros do it.